In December of 2021, the Game Kitchen released Wounds of Eventide, the last free DLC expansion for Blasphemous, and included among the items and prayers that were added to the game are new story details, where the penitent one learns more of the abstract will referred to as the miracle. The information he learns sets him on a quest that culminates in a new ending to the game, one that is truly blasphemous, and sets up the events of a second game in the series due to come out in a few years. In classic blasphemous fashion, this information is drip-fed to the penitent one through character dialogues and item descriptions, making it a little hard to understand everything. This is compounded by the need to have a firm understanding of the Penitent One's original quest from the base game, which was told in exactly the same way. Since it can be pretty difficult to keep the story straight, let's organize it all and put it together from beginning to end so that we can understand everything in the wounds of Eventide in full, and prepare ourselves for the craziness that is going to be Blasphemous 2. Now, before we dive into the wounds of Eventide, it's important to know the details of the Penitent One's original penitence, all he goes through to complete it, and what the possible outcomes are when he does complete it. I would actually recommend you watch the story summary I did on the game a while back so you have a good understanding of everything, but if you don't want to do that, here's a high-level overview of the story from the original game. Additionally, if you're already comfortable with the story and don't need a recap, feel free to jump to the time on the screen to skip this and get right into the content of Wounds of Eventide. Blasphemous takes place in Custodia, a land where the populace has a religion where they worship a divine entity referred to as the Miracle, whose blessings and curses have a very real impact on the people that live here. At the head of this religion is a man named Escrabar, who, at some point in the past, felt that the miracle had forsaken Custodia, and as a result, turned his throne on his congregation. The miracle chose to intervene and transformed Escrabar into a gigantic tree and burned him down. His throne ended up at the top of a huge pile of ash, and as people scrambled to take Escrabar's place, they fell into the ash and became monsters, which now roam the land. Escrabar was also reanimated by the miracle, and he is now charged with guarding the turned throne and the cradle of affliction, his old crown, against those that would seek to claim it. That is, until one chosen by the miracle would defeat him and take his place as the father of Custodia. That champion ends up being a voiceless, faceless warrior of the Brotherhood of the Silent Sorrow. After being approached by a scholar of the miracle who explained that it had set its will upon him, the man pulls Mia Culpa, the sword of guilt, from the kneeling stone, thus becoming the penitent one, and sets out on his quest to claim his place on the turned throne. He experiences hardship along the way, being killed by another penitent, Chrysanta of the Rapt Agony, whose penance was to oppose the one that drew Mia Culpa, mainly as a test for the Miracle's champion to overcome, as well as many other hazards in his journey. But every time he falls, he rises again, which is proof that he has the Miracle's favor. With this power, the Penitent One is able to meet with the three guardian visages of the Miracle, who recognize him as the one chosen by the Miracle and bestow upon him three holy wounds which give him access to the Mother of Mothers, the Church of the Religion of Custodia. Before entering, he's attacked by Esdras, a former soldier of the Anointed Legion, who is defending the Church from the Penitent One, and his deceased sister, Perpetua, who has a power to speak to her brother from the afterlife. Upon defeating the two, the Penitent One gains access to the Church, climbs its great halls, and meets Chrysanta again on its rooftops. This time, he defeats her, but she flees before he can deal the finishing blow. He then moves on, meeting Escobar in the highest chamber, beating him in battle, watching him transform into his final form, the last son of the miracle, and then beating him again, watching his crimson form depart to the other side of the dream. 
The penitent one then stands before the mountain of ash. However, if he tries climbing it, then he will sink into it and be consumed by the ash, just like everyone else had. In order to climb this mountain, he needs to complete his true penance, which was assigned to him when he drew Mia Culpa. Using the power of his sword, along with other relics he's gathered in his journey, the penitent one absorbs all of the guilt of Custodia into his being. Despite being heavy with this guilt, he will remain light and make it to the turned throne, whereupon he kills himself with Mia Culpa. And this time, instead of being resurrected by the miracle, he's transformed into a tree. A tree that holds all of the guilt of Custodia. His sacrifice frees the populace of the land from their guilt, thus saving them from the miracle. Thankful for their freedom, the populace worships the arboreal form of the penitent one as the new father and the last son of the miracle and Custodia enters a new age. Just before the game ends, Chrysanta commits one final act of blasphemy and pulls Mia Culpa from the wooden body of the Penitent One. The effects of this action remain to be seen. This is the story as it's told in the base game with the expectation that any future installments of the series would build off of Chrysanta's act in the good ending. And in the time between the Penitent One's sacrifice and Chrysantha pulling Mia Culpa, there was an age of peace where the populace of Custodia was free from the miracle. However, the fact that the Penitent One's journey was one that he was put on by the miracle, as well as Deo Gracias' statement that penance never ends, only changes, implies that this was an outcome the entity wanted meaning the Penitent One's sacrifice didn't truly free Custodia from the miracle, and that it's still at its mercy. Which brings us to the wounds of Eventide, whose story starts with the holy visages created by the miracle. These guardians were created from some of the most fervent and pious followers of the miracle, ones that were witness to the first miracle, the transformation of the young man into the Twisted One. The story told in the Santo Credo is that there are three, and each one is responsible for guarding one of the holy wounds that His Holiness, Escribar, is meant to suffer in his penance. However, the truth is that there were not three visages created, but four. The fourth visage, unlike the others, who were only able to see the Father at the moment of the first miracle, was able to see past the constraints of the mortal world and peer into the dream where he saw what the miracle truly was. Three heads crying tears of gold floating in a gray void. A divine trinity, the high wills. As the blessings and punishments of the entities began affecting those that lived in Custodia, the fourth visage watched the populace come to believe that they were being punished by a divine will that they could never understand, and name that will the miracle. He watched as they began to prostrate themselves before it, and revere it to try and gain its favor. And he watched how their fervor was harnessed by the high wills, who wove a kingdom for themselves on the other side of the dream. As that kingdom grew, so too did the vanity of the high wills, who intended to grow their kingdom until their power reached higher than the sky itself. The fourth guardian tried telling his brothers and the populace the truth of what was happening, that they were being tricked by these high wills, that there would be no release from the continual suffering and torment they suffered at the hands of the miracle, no release from the guilt they felt in their hearts, because the entities responsible for it would continually punish them for any reason, just to continue to receive their worship and thus grow in power. But no one would listen. This caused the visage to turn to desperate measures. Just like the other guardian visages, he held one of the holy wounds of his holiness, but his, the holy wound of abnegation, 
was the one that allowed one to peer to the other side of the dream and see the high wills for what they really were. He decided to bestow this wound upon a penitent in the mortal world so they could see the truth and share it with their peers. And to ensure the people believed the one that tried opening their eyes, he would need to choose one of the most prominent figures in Custodia. He couldn't choose Escrobar as he was entirely under the spell of the High Wills, and it was in his best interest to continue to perpetuate the cycle of fervor and worship that fed them. So the fourth visage chose the one whose faith surpassed even his holiness. Chrysanta of the rapt agony, the protector of his holiness and the mother of mothers, and captain of the anointed legion. Her prowess in battle, as well as the blessings her wrappings received from Escrobar, and consequently the miracle, meant that she would have the power to overthrow the high wills. Upon receiving the fourth wound, and therefore seeing the truth with her own eyes, Chrysanta learned the lies being fed to the people of Custodia, and felt her faith in the mother of mothers, and his holiness, and the miracle be shaken. But very soon after, the high wills, knowing of the fourth visage's betrayal, closed them again, blinding her to the truth and making her forget all that the holy wound had showed her, ending the fourth visage's attempt at overthrowing them before it could begin. After this action, the fourth visage was deemed a heretic and a deceiver, and as punishment for his crimes, he was banished to the mortal world and trapped within the roots of the knot of the three words, the sight of the first miracle, a kind of poetic justice for the one that tried convincing others to stop believing in it. But his punishment didn't end there. The traitor also had his eyes ripped out. One was delivered to the ossuary under the church of Albero where Isidora, voice of the dead, was to guard it. The other was taken to the sea, in the region of mourning and havoc, where it was never heard from again. But following its disappearance, rumors of a golden glint in the water that pulled ships to their doom started to emerge. To ensure that nobody could meet with a traitorous visage, the High Wills locked the way to the roots of the knot of the three words behind an illusory door in the library of the negated words, and gave the key to the watchman. Diosdado for safekeeping. Thus was the ultimate fate of the fourth visage, the traitor decreed. He was to suffer in the dark for eternity for his sacrilegious actions, separated from his brothers and the other side of the dream, powerless to do anything to stop the high wills. However, before the moment of his exile, the traitor committed one final act of defiance to the High Wills. Their blinding of Chrysanta, following her enlightenment, had taught him a valuable lesson. That the High Wills could and would stop any kind of obvious opposition to their will. Meaning if they were to be overthrown, they would need to be blind to their impending doom until it was too late. And the best way to achieve that was by making the instrument of their destruction come from their own hands. Therefore, before the moment of his banishment, the visage stole the true essence of an item that he foresaw would help in overthrowing the High Wills, an item that the High Wills themselves would eventually create, thereby making them have a hand in their own destruction. And until that relic was created, and a warrior deemed worthy enough by the High Wills came to possess it, he would have to wait. Time passed, and life in Custodia went on. The populace continued to revere the seemingly ununderstandable miracle. The Holy Wills continued to grow in power in their kingdom, now named the Land of Endless Processions. Chrysanta, without a penance since her blinding, waited for a new directive from the Divine Will. 
It was during this period that Perpetua met her untimely demise and, subsequently, departed to the other side of the dream. Although unrecognized at the time, this would end up being one of the most important events to occur in Custodia. And this was due to Perpetua's ability to speak to her brother Esdras from the afterlife. While Perpetua was on the mortal plane with her brother, she was fooled into believing the myth of the miracle, just like everybody else in Custodia. But once she departed to the other side of the dream, she was able to see the miracle for what it really was, as well as the kingdom the High Wills were crafting for themselves by taking advantage of Custodia and its people. And thanks to her connection with her brother, she could feed this information back to him, and thus, the mortal world. However, the boundary between the worlds weakened Perpetua's voice, making it harder for her words to reach her brother. And Ezra's mind had been clouded with grief over his sister's loss, as well as interference from the miracle, who had created a facsimile of Perpetua, perhaps to comfort Ezra's in his despair, making it harder for him to hear her. So just like the traitorous visage, Perpetua would have to wait until a warrior with a will strong enough to hear her came forth and could hear the truth. Finally, after an unknown time, that chance comes. Mia culpa, the sword of manifested guilt, is created by the miracle, and the entity, seeing that Escrobar's time as the head of the religion of Custodia has come to its end, and that the populace needs a new father, a new symbol of the miracle to worship, chooses a champion of its own to start a new age in the world. However, unknown to them, they've also just created the instrument of their own destruction. During his journey, their champion meets with Perpetua, not the false version created by the miracle, but the real one, behind the back of the miracle, who reveals to him that there is a lie in Custodia, and instead of perpetuating it, he can stand against it. She asks him to take her scapular and meet with her brother, promising that once he sees the token, he will know the penitent one has her blessing and will agree to help. Initially hesitant, a seed of doubt has been planted in the mind of the miracle's champion and he decides to see if Perpetua's story holds any water. He completes the Three Humiliations, a process that confirms that he is indeed the Miracle's Chosen One, then sets out for the Mother of Mothers, where he meets Esdras on the bridge of the Three Calvaries. Just as Perpetua said, Esdras catches a glimpse of her scapular and realizes it must mean she wants him to help the Penitent One. He heads off to the Kneeling Stone, a place where he will be able to hear her clearly, and when the Penitent One finds him there a short time later, Esdras reveals that the grief and misdirections of the miracle that had clouded his mind are gone, allowing him to hear his sister's voice. Just as Perpetua told him, Esdras reveals to the Penitent One that there is another path for him to take and gives him something that fell into his care a long time ago. The key that leads to that which the miracle never wanted to see the light of day. The roots of the knot of the three words. The prison of the fourth guardian visage. After helping Diostado in the library of the negated words, the penitent one makes his way through the hidden illusory door to come face to face with the visage who tells him of his past and asks him to get his eyes back. Guided by the hints given to him by the visage, the penitent one travels to Mourning and Havoc where he slays Sierpes, the giant snake that resides in the sea's dark waters, to reclaim the visage's left eye, and to the ossuary below the church in Alboro where he defeats Isidora, voice of the dead, to retrieve the visage's right eye. He returns them to the visage, who then shares the truth of the high wills with the penitent one. He then gives him that which he stole all those years ago. The true heart of Mia Culpa, which will allow the penitent one to stand against those that are holding Custodia captive. 
However, the Visage also advises that there is still one more task to complete before he can do so. He tells the Penitent One that he will need to remove the veil that the miracle has cast over someone, someone that has also seen the truth and will help him get to the High Wills, someone familiar to both him and the Visage, Chrysanta of the Rapt Agony, who by this point had a new penance from the miracle. She was to oppose the one that claimed Mia Culpa. The Visage tells the Penitent One that when he beats Chrysanta with Mia Culpa's true heart installed in the blade, it will wound her soul so grievously that the chains of the miracle will be broken and she will again see the truth. His new directive set, the Penitent One makes his way to the Archithedral rooftops where he meets Chrysanta. The two engage in battle, and just when it seems the Penitent One has defeated her, Chrysanta reflects on the mission given to her by the High Wills, the Great Ones that dwell in the Endless Processions. The moment re-energizes her, and she starts another assault on the Penitent One. The power she showed in their previous fight is nothing compared to what she shows now, as the speed of all of her attacks has increased while the downtime between her attacks has decreased significantly, and she now has the ability to launch beams of magic at the Penitent One. The ferocity of her attacks leave him very little time to ready a defense, much less leave time for a substantial counterattack. However, despite these odds, the Penitent One patiently dodges and blocks Chrysanthemum's attacks, and slowly wears her down until the moment arises that he strikes her down for good. Once again left kneeling before the Penitent One, Chrysanta accepts her fate. But instead of striking her down, the Penitent One uses the sword core in Mia Culpa to do as the Fourth Visage said and break the chains of the miracle that held Chrysanta's mind prisoner. With the truth rushing back into her head again, Chrysanta feels the doubt in her faith that she felt before. She heads back to the Kneeling Stone to heal this grievous wound in her soul. When the Penitent One finds her there a short time later, Chrysanta recognizes that the Penitent One, through wielding Mia Culpa and being the Miracle's champion, is the one that can break the hold that the High Wills have on Custodia and truly free the people. She gives him the fourth Holy Wound, bestowed upon her by the Fourth Visage all that time ago, which will allow him to access the land of the Endless Processions, where he would finally be able to meet the High Wills face to face. However, before he can make that journey, the Penitent One still needs to reach the Turned Throne, and to do that, he still needs to complete his penance. So he sets out and gathers all of the guilt in Custodia, releases His Holiness Escrobar from his torment, and climbs the Mountain of Ash to reach the Turned Throne. Sensing the presence of the fourth wound, the throne trembles, then rises from the ash, transporting the Penitent One to the other side of the dream, to the land of the Endless Processions. The Penitent One moves forward until coming upon Escrobar once again, but not the tormented, imprisoned version from the mortal world, but the form that was released when he was killed by the Penitent One. Once he came to the other side of the dream, he was made the guardian to the High Wills, and in keeping with his duty, he launches a multitude of new magical attacks upon the Penitent One, determined to stop the man from reaching his masters. But his opponent is able to dodge them thanks to his combat prowess and the assistance of an ally. Chrysanta has managed to travel to the Endless Processions as well, and is able to protect the Penitent One from one of Escrobar's attacks thanks to her wrappings, which ironically received their power through blessings from His Holiness himself. With one being the sword and the other being the shield, the Penitent One and Chrysanta are able to defeat Escrobar once again and destroy his crimson body. The way finally unimpeded the Penitent One goes forth and comes face to face with the entities behind the miracle, behind Custodia's suffering, the High Wills. 
upon seeing the Penitent One and Chrysantha before them, the beings know what the two are here to do. Strike them down, destroy their work, and end the miracle's influence. Blessings and curses alike. The High Wills warn that the deed they would commit would be a sin that could never be forgiven and will leave them hated and loathed. A curse that would last forever. However, finding the freedom of the people from the ungodly will of these beings to be worth the curse, the Penitent One and Chrysantha draw their weapons and attack the High Wills. The power of their weapons, each of which has been blessed by the entities in its own way, allow them to wound and destroy these creatures, ending their reign over Custodia forever. As the light from the High Will's end subsides, the Penitent One sees the Twisted One, the Father, alone in a barren field. He reaches down and caresses his cheek, and then fades away. The Penitent One then looks down at Mia Culpa and watches the blade of the weapon fade away in the same manner. And then the realization hits him. Without the power of the High Wills, the various manifestations of the miracle are coming to an end. He wonders how changed Custodia will be now that the miracle's influence has ended. Wonders how it's going to look when he returns. And as he wonders this, he also remembers that his own life is tied to the power of the miracle. At various points throughout his journey, he succumbed to the trials of his quest, only to be resurrected by the entity. And now, without the power of the miracle to keep him alive, he feels life drain away from his body until he passes away. Chrysantha, who was present at his first passing, and also his last, carries him from the land of endless processions, with Deo Gracias trailing her. The two lay him in a simple coffin, say a small prayer over him, then close the lid on the anonymous penitent that gave everything to save the people of Custodia, bringing a true end to the story of Blasphemous. Well, not quite. With the Wounds of Eventide, the developers of Blasphemous not only answered some of the questions we'd had about the world of Custodia, but they gave a definitive end to the narrative they'd been working on for years, leaving us with a story that's incredibly fun to piece together and see in full. However, in classic Blasphemous fashion, they couldn't help but to show a, a little something extra in the ending that only raised more questions. Who is the person floating in this cocoon? Is it the Penitent One Reborn? Who was it that revived him? How did they do it? And most importantly, why did they do it? What new horror has fallen upon Custodia that necessitates the return of its savior? Unfortunately, we'll have to wait for the answers to these questions as they lie in the sequel to the game that aims to launch in a few years. But as for the story of the first game, it is now complete. Now, I think I got everything and explained it all in a way that makes sense, but if you still have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Likewise, feel free to share any thoughts or theories you may have about the game, or point out anything I missed. I'd be happy to read them. But, yeah, that's it for this one, so thank you for watching and see you later. The story told in the Santo Credo The story told in the Santo Credo is that the story told in the Santo Credo is that there are three fucking sh**.